Praise the Lord. I would invite you to turn your Bibles with me to the book of Philippians as we continue to walk through that book verse by verse. Philippians chapter 1. We're going to start, or I should say pick back up at verse 12 in Philippians chapter 1. So far I've been delighted to look at what we've seen. And we've only seen a, a small portion, really just the beginning of the book. There's so much more to get to. We're still in chapter 1. Chapter 1, verse 12. And we see Apostle Paul writing, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And he writes this. He says, Now I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel, so that my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole excuse me, yeah, as, uh, throughout the whole of Praetorian Guard and to everyone else, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment, have far more courage to speak the word of God without fear. Let's go to the Lord in prayer, asking that He would bless the preaching of His Word. Father, we're thankful that we can worship You openly in a public setting like this with, uh, without fear of what Paul the Apostle went through. Uh, persecution and imprisonment. Yet, Father, we're thankful on the flip side that you allow your people to go through such trials and such difficulties in this world, knowing that such, such pain, such hardship, procures a particular weight of glory for us in heaven. We're thankful that your word instructs us concerning these things, concerning the truth of persecution and what it means to be persecuted for the Lord Jesus Christ and what rewards are to be gained as a result of such a blessed thing. We're thankful that the Lord Jesus Christ, in light of all this, still reigns and rules and is sovereign and even to this very moment, king over all creation, owner of all things. We pray, Father, that the word would have its due course in our lives. It would have a great effect upon us. We would be under its influence. I pray that the Holy Spirit would work as His Word is proclaimed. And that the Lord Jesus Christ is exalted. Though we are going to be looking at a subject that doesn't directly pertain to the work of Christ, yet we know all roads in the Bible lead to Golgotha. They lead to Calvary's cross. And so may that be where our eyes are turned even this morning. And we pray that He was glorified. And it's in His name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, brethren, we have an innate um, trait that God has given every one of us. And it is to seek the path of least resistance. Uh, it's to seek the path of pleasure. To seek the path that avoids hardship and difficulty. Uh, this, this is connected to our will to live. We, we don't want to die. Uh, God has implanted within us each that desire. And we ought to be grateful for that. that that's, that's for our benefit. And likewise, this, uh, this bent to, to avoid anything that would cause us trouble is also a good thing. Because it saves us a lot of pain. It saves us a lot of pain. But when we think about it in a spiritual sense, we're the same way. We, we want everything to be easy, spiritually speaking. We know they're not going to be, but we still, we still want that, and we seek it even. Oftentimes we find ourselves going along the path of least resistance. However, the problem is the, the path that, that Christ speaks of, the narrow road or the narrow path, that path is the path of most resistance. You see, this is, this is uh, you could say it's, it's paradoxically against what we innately and, and naturally go toward and that's why we see time and time again in the Bible, salvation being addressed and being discussed as what? As a supernatural act of God. Because we wouldn't do it. We wouldn't seek it. We wouldn't, we wouldn't continue on this road. We see Paul there in, in, uh, right here in chapter 1, verse 6. He says, God's going to keep you in this process of sanctification. Why? Because it's, an e it's, a, it's a difficult process. It's not an easy one. 
And so God's got to keep us on that path, as it were, that path of great resistance. And as we look at this, these portion, this portion of Scripture, these verses, what we're going to see is that that path of, of most resistance, that path of persecution, that path of, of being ridiculed and being slandered and being hated for the name of Jesus Christ is actually the best path, which seems, uh, which seems like a contradiction. Seems like I'm going against myself when I say that, but I tell you, Scripture presents it in that way. In fact, we saw that last week a little bit as we, we, we thought about uh, where Paul says the Philippians partook of grace with him. We, you remember that? He, saw, he said that. And he was talking about the, the reproach and the shame of having been persecuted for Christ's sake and been imprisoned. Paul wasn't a man who had a good name. In, in, in ancient Rome, neither was Jesus. To identify yourself with these men was a, was a scandal. You were taking part in the scandal. You were taking part in that joke. But Paul says, such things are grace. Such things are uh, great. They are glorious. And we find that all throughout the Bible, that those things are present, presented in that way. We saw last week in Hebrews 11, where the, the, the hall of, of, of believers, the hall of faith is given to us, where we see this, uh, this beautiful documentation of all these Old Testament saints who believed God's promises, but they, undergo, they underwent, I should say, great trials and, and great persecution. We find that, especially at the end of the chapter there in Romans 11, or excuse me, in Hebrews 11. We find that the, that the writers really wanted to send that point home, that these people not only went through hard times, they were persecuted for their belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so we're going to consider in more depth the, the topic of persecution. In fact, that's the title of the sermon. It's Truths About Persecution. Truths About Persecution. And we're going to see three things this morning. Three, three, uh, three thesis statements, you can say three points. One being, and we're going to see them come out of this text and other passages in Scripture. Firstly, the, the first point is that persecution helps the spread of the gospel. Persecution helps the spread of the gospel. Secondly, I want us to also see that uh, persecution gives other Christians boldness. It induces boldness in God's people. And then thirdly, I want to conclude, bring it to a concluding point, uh, being that persecution, therefore, is good for the church. It is healthy for the church. It, it shapes us up. It puts us on a diet plan, you can say, and gets the church in shape. And certainly it does. We'll see that as we go through here. So let's look at that first point. Persecution helps the spread of the gospel. And we'll see that in... Verses 12 and verse 13. But before we do that, we need to remember, and I mentioned this already, throughout Scripture, it is promised to us that we're going to be persecuted. In fact, it's even assumed. It's just assumed as a, as a given presupposition, if you're going to follow after God in a world that is, it is against God and has, has fallen away from God, then you will have these things come upon you in the Bible does not even seek to explain it in the sense of uh, make a reason for it, even though it does. It's just assumed. In fact, 2 Timothy 3.12, Paul says, Indeed, all who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It's, it's not something that is, uh, that is a possibility. It will happen. And even in our day, it happens to a very small extent. It's, it's very small in comparison to what we would consider uh, other people and other believers go, to, go through in other countries. But even in America today, if you seek to live godly in Christ Jesus, you're going to be persecuted by family, by friends. You're going to be ostracized. You're going to be scan, uh, slandered. You're going to be hated for the gospel's sake because they hate God. And you represent God to them. You remind them. In fact, if you're a born-again Christian, you bear fruit. You're reminding what? The unbelieving world of the God of glory whom they hate. That's why you're persecuted. That's why persecution happens. Now, Jesus told his disciples, I mentioned this before in other sermons, Jesus told his disciples at the, the Last Supper, they would have tribulation. And under that umbrella is certainly persecution. That's really what was in mind there. I mean, you can imagine, Jesus is about to be persecuted himself. He's about to be killed as a, as a martyr for the truth. And you could say Stephen in Acts 7 was the first martyr in the early church, but if you really want to be 
ultra technical with it to be the Lord Jesus himself. The very head of the church was the first martyr. So it is inevitable because of the wickedness of man. It is an inevitable thing that will, that will encounter us and we will encounter it. We will meet it along this path that we walk to glory. It will be that resistance that we see on this narrow road. But in light of this, in light of that, in light of the fact that it causes us to lose friends and family and reputation, money, finances, maybe even, uh, maybe even our lives. Yet, on top of that, we find Scripture clearly says that it helps gospel ministry. Look with me at verse 12. What does Paul say? Now, I want you to know, brethren, and he, he's, he's doing a transition here. He's given his introductory uh, remarks, and now he's, he's wanting to get into the nitty-gritty of what's, what's going on currently in his life. He's, he's actually in prison for the gospel's sake. So he's not in the best spot he's ever been in terms of the, the, the eyes of, uh, of man. However, what does he say? Now, I want you to know, brethren, that my circumstances, he's speaking of his imprisonment, and not only that, but all that has surrounded that, have turned out for the greater progress of the gospel. That is very significant. Underline that if you, if you have a pen with you. Underline that. Greater progress. What, what brings about greater progress? Paul's being in prison? I mean, he was going around traveling, preaching, and now it's stopped. He says, such an act of providence has ordered it to be so that it now helps the gospel's spreading. The Greek word progress here is prokope, and it means furtherance, the advancement. It's, it's marching on. His truth is marching on, the battle of the republic. In Christ, in Christ's gospel, through persecution, through the doorway of persecution, bursts into the world, as it were. The car of the gospel runs on the gas of persecution. It's an interesting dichotomy, very much so. <coughs> Another example of, of uh, the gospel being blessed and helped by persecution is in Acts chapter 5. If you want to turn there, Acts chapter 5 with me. We actually looked at it last week, but I want to look at uh, a little bit more than we looked at last week. Maybe we look at just one verse. Acts chapter 5, right at the end. Verse 40, verse 40 of Acts chapter 5. That's Baptist air conditioning you hear, by the way. All the pages flipping. So, I praise God for that. That's the sweetest sound in a preacher's ear. It's the sweetest sound that I can hear. It's the, the pages of Bibles uh, being, being flipped. Anyways, in verse 40... says they took his advice, and after calling the apostles in, they flogged them and ordered them not to speak in the name of Jesus, and then released them. So they went on their way from the presence of the council. That's the, uh, the Sanhedrin. That would have been like the, the court in Jerusalem. Rejoicing that they had been considered worthy to suffer shame for his name. And we, we saw that last week in verse 42. And every day, and in the temple, and... From house to house, they kept right on teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ, as the Messiah. So immediately, they go out and do the same exact thing, in fact, more so. It's, it's inferred, uh, in verse 42, that, that the activities that they were engaging in before have actually uh, been, been uh, we could say, grown. That they, the, the ministries have been enlarged now as a result of the persecution. So what happens next? Well, remember, the chapter breaks aren't in the original text. So immediately in chapter 6, verse 1, what do we find? Now, at this time, while the disciples were increasing in number. So what immediately happens, even though persecution has come upon the apostles? And a flogging, I, I mentioned last week, wasn't, wasn't a pleasurable experience. It was very excruciatingly painful. So it was, a, it was a very clear message sent by the religious authorities in Jerusalem. They did not want the gospel to be proclaimed. Yet they did it anyways. And immediately God in His providence blesses the preaching in such a way that people are born again. Their disciples are increasing in number. This is already on top of the, the 3,000 that are converted to Pentecost and more added later. This is on top of all of that. Still more growth. 
It's almost as if persecution is like, a, uh, is like an exciting agent in the mixture. It, it just excites gospel ministry. And there is even a sense, I think, you can speak even as a Christian. I mentioned we're, we're, we're in certain small ways persecuted as believers here in America. Maybe by family and friends, not really by the government or anything like that. At least not yet. It's coming. But we think about that. And I think you can testify to that fact that there's an aspect in which when you're persecuted, it's like, yes, his truth continues on. And I'm more excited even more so to do it. Because even that is an encouragement because his word's fulfilled in that, which is odd. It shows us that God's word is fulfilled even in that. There's something about when the gospel is trying, when people try to suppress the gospel, that it, it slips through their hands at a faster rate if they were not. It, it, it moves quicker when it's being chased. It, it, there's something about it, and it, it's very hard for us to describe, but it's interesting um, that we can trace this pattern. We can see this all throughout church history. This isn't something that with merely a biblical history, this has happened since all time. I mean, that, ever since God has had his people facing the planet, beginning in Adam, with Adam and Eve, all the way down to where we are today, this is, this is a, a repeated pattern. And God uses it in such a way. So let's go back to Philippians chapter 1. It's really incredible. It really is. It, it ought to induce us to praise the living God for these things. In verse 13, what does he say next? He says, so that my imprisonment, that's really a synonym for circumstances. That's really what he's, he has in mind here. In the cause of Christ. It was interesting, I was studying the Greek. The, the word cause doesn't actually exist. In the Greek. It's not there. It actually would just read, if you were to look at it in the original Greek, it's my imprisonment in Christ. Paul sees his being persecuted for Christ's sake as so, so connected with following Jesus, he says, I'm doing it in Christ. I'm here persecuted. I'm here in prison in Christ. This is a part of it. This is what this is what you get when you follow Jesus. That's why it's so imperative, brethren, that we call people to count the cost. That's why oftentimes when I hear evangelical preachers, American preachers, talk about salvation, it's so sickening. It's so sickening because it's so cheap. They talk about salvation so cheap. And they even present it in such a way like, oh, you know, Jesus will make your life better. Well, guess what? My life got worse after I started following Jesus. If you want to look at it from the world's eyes, however, in the sight of God, and from a spiritual perspective, I was radically blessed and greatly blessed I am to this day. They're, they're, they're observing salvation as it were. They're looking at it from a worldly perspective. I'll tell you, from a worldly perspective, salvation, being a follower of Christ, being a disciple of Christ, is the greatest um, act, the greatest, I should say, foolish act you could possibly do. The most stupid, against wisdom, against common sense thing you could do, because really, in the sight of of this world, there's nothing in it to do. But there's everything to gain in the life to come. And that's why Jesus said, if you were to follow me, you must take up your cross. Do you know what was going through the minds of disciples when Jesus says, take up your cross? You know what was going through their minds? Was the Roman execution of crucifixion. That was the first thing. Right before they put you on the cross, after they had flogged you, they walk you through the city to humiliate you. So he's saying, all right, you want to be a follower? Take up your cross after already having been beaten, and walk through the city and be made fun of by everybody, and then come with me and die. It was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and I'm not the biggest fan of Dietrich Bonhoeffer. I think he had a lot of, th a lot of things wrong. I would not suggest you look to him as a trusted source. But he did write an interesting book on discipleship. It has a couple of good things in it. But he said, when Christ bids a man to become a disciple, he bids him to die. That's true. But in our death, in our dying to us, we are alive to God forevermore. Amen. So he says, my imprisonment in the cause of Christ has become well known throughout the whole Praetorian Guard and to everyone else. This is something that has garnered attention. And that's really what's in view here. That's, that's, uh, that's what's happening. Because of who Paul is, because of the gospel for which he stands, and the fact that he's unwavering, he's not moving, he's not cowering, everybody knows about him. 
You can imagine the countless opportunities that he has had to proclaim the precious gospel of life. He says it's become, I've become, a, he says it, uh, it's become well known. The Greek word there, phreneros, means plainly known. It's manifest, it's clear. Everybody's aware not only of, of who I am or where, where, I, where I'm at and what's going on right now, but the gospel for which I stand. We see this in, uh, in Acts 16 when Paul and Silas are in prison. Philippi, we find that they, they were singing hymns. Certainly, they had been gone. They'd done, done some gospel preaching, some some jail cell preaching. Because after the earthquake happened, the Philippian jailer comes to them and says, "What must I do to be saved?" He knew what I got to be saved. He knew these things. They were they were proclaiming it in the prison. It's incredible to think that God uses these things, uses persecution, not only persecution, but He uses martyrdom. He uses the blood of the martyrs as the, as the, the water that He pours on the soil of the gospel. All right? The soil that the gospel is in, we could say, to grow it. The, the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church, as it has been said oftentimes before. And that's true. God uses the, the deaths of His saints on behalf of His Son, on behalf of the gospel message, to bring it to the world. To places that have yet to even hear it. We're going to consider a couple of um, martyrs a little later on. We'll see that second point. That persecution gives Christians, gives other Christians boldness. Gives other Christians boldness. Verse 14. What does he say next? He says, and that most of the brethren, trusting in the Lord because of my imprisonment. Guess what also has happened? Not only has God given Paul a platform upon which to stand to proclaim the gospel in his imprisonment, but he has also now given him fruit. He has given him spiritual children. He has given him descendants from him that he might raise them in faith. What does he say? They have far more courage to speak the Word of God without fear. There is something, and this is again, we look at it almost like a mystery. Because when we see other Christians persecuted, and they're staying strong, and they're remaining in the faith, they're holding fast to confession, there's something about that that excites something within us. At least for me, when I see another Christian who's been persecuted, for Christ's sake, it's like, yes, this is, this is delightful. <laughs> This is a grace. This is, this is wonderful. And I am now excited all the more to embrace Christ and to follow Him with more abandon. In fact, I love the Greek word here for without fear. Two words in English, without fear. It's one word in Greek. It's aphobos, which is where we get the word phobia. You, know, you say, I have a phobia of something. That's, 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 what that's, that's what that's from. It means fear. But the, 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 the prefix A in Greek is a negative. It's a negative. So saying you have no fear. You, it's a, there's a lack of fear in you when you look at other Christians being persecuted for the gospel's sake. We all need to have any phobos, that's for sure. Let's bring that into the vernacular, please. Let's, let's please bring that into the vernacular. I think it's interesting. I have a dear friend of mine who uh, has, I've done a lot of street preaching with. Well, I don't say a lot, but I've done it a few times. And uh, I've, I've told friends and family members about him because I'm so encouraged by his ministry. Uh, his name's Daniel, and he, uh, he lives in India. Well, he did live in India. He was kicked out for preaching the gospel. He lives in Nepal now. Uh, he's actually here in the States visiting for a few months, but he'll be back. In, in Nepal, and uh, the Lord greatly burdened him for India. It's the most unreached country in the entire world. Uh, India is. 900 million people live in India, and they've never heard the name of Jesus Christ. And I don't mean 900 million as in that's the population. The population of uh, India is 1.32, 1.33 billion people. It's, it's unimaginably large. But out of, that, out of that group, 990 million have never, ever heard of the blessed name of the Lord Jesus Christ. May God raise up, may God raise up missionaries to India in this place, in this, in this very room, by His grace. They need it desperately. But anyways, the Lord greatly burdened Brother Daniel to go out um, and, um, and to, to live in India. But he didn't do it like a lot of missionaries do. There's nothing wrong with raising support, nothing wrong with raising support, you know, uh, 
Travis mentioned in his prayer, the, the Brooks family, they, they raised support. I think it's a wonderful idea to, that they're inviting us to join with them in their ministry uh, through financial support. But this brother, he, uh, he was in the military and he had been uh, medically discharged. And so he got a little bit of a pension every month, very, very small amount of money. But in India, that's like a little fortune. And he went out there and that's all he lived off of by himself. And ended up marrying an Indian woman, started two churches, the Lord gave him many converts. And this guy's rock solid. This isn't some whack job. He, he preaches the truth and he's so passionate. But I'll tell you, he has the most incredible stories of being persecuted for Christ's sake. And I'm not talking about making fun, make fun of, I'm talking about almost killed multiple times for the gospel's sake. Because where the area he lived in, Hyderabad, India... There's a lot of Hindus in that area, and they hated, they detested the preaching of the gospel. Though the Lord was bringing fruit, and the Lord was blessing the word being preached. He asked me if you're starting two churches. And they were going out to unreached villages, very often preaching the gospel. So he has a couple stories of being literally a mob of, of these Hindus would be riled up by the Hindu leaders, and they would come and grab him, and they would try to strangle him to death. And he even said a couple times he was knocked out cold. He didn't remember and the events that took place. And uh, time after time again, these things happen. Persecuted, beat, stuff thrown at him. And he said the Lord even granted him the grace to find his persecutors, track them down, and uh, invite them to lunch. So you can imagine, that takes great grace. And I look at that, especially as he's very passionate about street preaching, and you know I am. And so I look at that, and I'm like, yes, uh, this is a guy I want to be around. This, kind of, this is like rock solid. This is amazing to see his dedication, because this is real. What we believe is real. It's true. And it's worth giving up everything for. He has a wife and four or five children. But it's worth him dying for that he might proclaim the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. He's actually been kicked out of India. He lives in Nepal now. Hopefully he'll get back in one day. Lord willing. But um, I think about him. I think about, uh, I was talking to a friend of mine last night. And um, <laughs> I did a little study and found out by a, a man who was in the early church named St. Dennis. And a uh, very interesting story behind him. But uh, he stood for the truth and was persecuted. And he was killed upon a, uh, upon a, a, a hill in Paris, France. What is modern day Paris, France now. And they ended up, um, uh, how, did, how did they pronounce it? They ended up naming the hill Mont, uh, Montmartre, I think is how you say it. Which is Mount of Martyrs. And uh, this man was killed for the gospel's sake. And you think about how God in his providence used the death of a, of a bishop. I think it was mid-200s A.D this bishop's death to bring the gospel to Europe. I mean, Paris is right in the middle of France, right in the middle of Europe. This is amazing. So God uses those things. God uses the death of his saints. He uses um, persecution to encourage other believers. And I read that story last night, and I was filled with joy. See, that's amazing. What an, what an heritage that is. A, a, another example, and this is one of my favorite stories, is the story of John Rogers, one of the first uh, martyrs in England for the gospel's sake. This is, this is post-Reformation England. Um, or I should say pre-Reformation. Excuse me. Or, I'm sorry. Post-Reformation. My apologies. But uh, he died in 1555. He had a wife and ten children. And he stood against the heresies of the, the Catholic Church. He very, very staunchly. He was very convinced that the, the Catholic Church was in error. And he held to the truth of Scripture with diligence and uh, with conviction. And he was asked many times to recant, lest he be burned at the stake. And he did not... Uh, of course, he did not recant. He did not take back what he believed. And so, uh, on that day, February 4th, 1555, John Rogers was led by his wife and his children. And they, they actually said that the account was that it was such a joyful occasion, it was like his children were going to a wedding with him. And they went with him, and he was burned at the stake for the gospel's sake. And God used the blood of John Rogers mightily to bring the gospel to more people. And you read that and you're like, wow, it's incredible. It really is. It encourages us in our faith. Thirdly, and this is a concluding point, persecution, therefore, is good for the church. It produces more disciples, as we saw in Acts chapter 6, verse 1. It produces more followers of Christ. You see it in Paul's imprisonment there, as we just read. Also, we think about China. China is the place where Christians are often persecuted. In fact, though the church is so explosive in its growth right now in China, some people estimate 
that the, the church, the evangelical church in China, is now larger than the evangelical church in the United States, <laughs> which is unheard of. Anything. How are they growing? And it's very hard for us to estimate how many people are actually Christians in China because all the churches are unregistered underground home churches. Because the government won't allow them to be churches. In fact, you, you read all the time in the news, I see it, headlines about, oh, they knocked down this church's steeple. They took down the crosses in a church. They, I, I watched a video just a few weeks ago. Uh, they entered into a worship service, police inside China, and, and they were trying to disrupt the worship services, and people just kept going. You know, they, they act like they almost weren't there. And we read that and we see, yes, even in that environment, in fact, in that environment, it's like the, it's like the oven that the, that the bread of the gospel is cooked fully. It, it, it's just something about it. It's incredible, really. And it fuels boldness, as we saw. It glorifies God. It glorifies God. Because it, it shows to the world, it shows to the world that our, our God is worthy of our very lives. That in light of the message of the gospel, the worth and the value and the weightiness of the fame and the glory of Jesus Christ, my life is meaningless in comparison to such. And it will come and it will go. Your life's going to come and go anyways. You might as well give it up for something that is important. Because sports and finances and an empire, money and wealth and politics and whatever else, video games, those things will pass away. They will burn they will burn. It shows the world the gospel is true. The gospel message is the true message. That this isn't just stuff that we do to be moral people. To be upstanding citizens. This is stuff that we're, we're willing to give our very lives for. If God demands that of us. And He demands that of every Christian. You know what? Most of, in fact, probably all of us will never be Martyr for Christ. Probably not. We'll probably stay in the United States and, and be safe. And that's that's a mercy of God in and of itself. But we better, every day, count the cost. Because it could. It could. It absolutely could. And ultimately, just being persecuted for the gospel's sake procures for us rewards in heaven. In closing, turn to 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, very briefly. In verse 1, Paul speaking to Timothy, he gives, he gives an exhortation to Timothy. He says, I solemnly charge you in the presence of God and of Jesus Christ, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Rebuke, exhort with great patience and instruction. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But wanting to have their ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires and will turn away their ears from the truth. And will turn aside the myths. But you be sober in all things, endure hardship. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. For I am already being poured out as a drink offering and the time of my departure has come. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the course. I have kept the faith. Verse 8, this is what I want to highlight. In the future there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day. And not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearance. <coughs> Paul was persecuted, but Paul knew that there's reward. There's reward in heaven. The labor, and I, I want us to remember this, the labor in the Lord, your labors in the Lord are not in vain. I watched a video on Facebook. Uh, yesterday, I think it was, and it was it was filmed by a, a famous pastor here in the states. But he was over in South Korea, and he was standing in front of a standing in front of a, a graveyard. And he said, he said, I want to encourage all uh, missionaries out there on the field right now who are discouraged, discouraged that you're not seeing fruit, discouraged that you're not seeing God work. Because he said, behind me is a is a graveyard filled with people, believers who came to South Korea. To proclaim the gospel and they saw no fruit. And now we're here today, years later, well after their deaths. And South Korea is one of the most Christian nations in the world. Huge. In fact, the largest, the very the largest church in the entire world is in South Korea. It's, it's pushing mega church limits a little too far. It's like a hundred and something thousand people. But 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 the, the point stands 
the gospel has gone forth well after those who brought it passed away. So don't look for earthly rewards even. Look for the heavenly ones. Look for the ones that are coming in heaven. Look to those rewards because that is what matters. I mentioned it earlier. This life is vanity. Vanity of vanities. But our souls remain on. They continue on. And so being persecuted for Christ's sake procures for God's people great, unimaginably glorious rewards in heaven. And Paul terms it, he, he, he says, I'm going to be given a crown of righteousness. That's beautiful. It's beautiful. So, the use section, the imperatives now, what are, the, what are we going to do in light of this? I mentioned a couple of things. Count the cost every day of following Christ because we will suffer persecution. Be ready to give your life up. Every day you have to give your life up. Anyways, to follow after our Lord. But keep in mind also that you might be persecuted to the extent that that will happen. It's coming in America. It is inevitable. And we ought not to expect anything else. But we ought to be diligent to try and preserve freedom and unity in the nation. And be filled with joy, brethren. That God has sent before us many giants of the faith. Men of, of, of character that I cannot even begin to explain. Women who have, who have loved the appearing of our Lord, as Paul mentions here put us to shame. And they gave their lives for the gospel. We can follow in their footsteps. It's not like we don't have examples. <laughs> it's unimaginable. I, mean, I was thinking, I was like, John Rogers, but you, there's so many others. So many others were burned burn at the stake. I think about the story I read of, of two women uh, that they were, they were killed for their faith <laughs> in a certain way that uh, they would chain you on the seashore to rocks and when the tide would come if you drown. And they were known as they were dying to be singing the Psalms. Singing songs. It's amazing. I could have used so many stories to describe the persecution that God's people experience, but they do it with joy. So, brethren, go forth into the world that hates you. Go forth into the world that is going to persecute you. Go, continue, run, run the race, run, run along the path of most resistance, knowing that our Lord went, the disciples went, the people I mentioned went. Puritans went, our forefathers, our grandparents perhaps, have already gone on to be with the Lord, they went. We can go. It is possible. It's impossible with man, but what's impossible with man is possible with God, as our Lord says. And those of you who perhaps have the thought of being persecuted cower in fear, and it's not out of a Christian immaturity, but out of lack of faith. The call for you today is to put your faith in the living God. I call all of you who are unconverted, who are unbelievers, to turn from your wicked ways and to embrace the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ and to count the cost, to give up your life. Give it up. It's going to be demanded of you regardless. It will. So give it up to God in joyful submission. See, you'll bow the knee one day to Christ. Either it will be in joyful submission or it will be with a snarl and with reluctance. Which side shall you be on? Embrace the sun. Kiss. What does Psalm 2 say? Kiss the sun, lest, his, uh, lest he not be angry. And for his wrath is soon kindled, and he, you perish in the way, as we saw on Wednesday night. For it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. So that's what we've seen here. In Philippians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. Truths concerning persecution. Let us, let us walk away with this conclusion, as Paul said even before he wrote these verses, that it is a grace to be persecuted for Christ's sake. For Christ entered into time. He condescended and he uh, breached, you could say, into time and interposed himself between God and man was hung on Calvary's cross, suspended between heaven and earth, for he is the mediator who stands between God and man. <coughs> and he died for sinners and was raised and is exalted in heaven. And all who repent, all who put their trust in him, are born a second time, are given his spirit from above, are saved to his own glory. 
are given a righteousness that is not their own. A justitia alienum, as the Latin puts it. A righteousness that is alien to us. A perfect righteousness that God sees and says, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. And it is that Son that I pray you would glorify today and forevermore. <laughs> so we say, to Christ be glory. Solas Christus et sola Deo Gloria. Christ alone, and to God be the glory alone. Let's pray. Oh God, bless the word that has gone forth. Transform us, oh God. Make us like Christ. We just want to be like Him. And if if before us is, is laid a path of great tribulation and great hardship for his sake, we joyfully say with Paul, it is a grace and we embrace it. We, we, like John Rogers, call our family members to walk with us to the place of death for our Lord's sake. Oh God, if anyone here fears death, as Scripture says, those who are lost are enslaved to, they are enslaved to the fear of death. I pray that the Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, the living Christ, would set them free today. And we pray that you are glorified, Father, now that your word has been preached and your Son has been lifted up. We know that when He is glorified, you are glorified, for He loves you and you love Him. And there is, a, there is an inseparable bond between the members of the Trinity that if we were to, to dwell upon, we would occupy an eternity of meditation with that simple truth. That the Father loves the Son, and the Son loves the Father. And that when the Father is glorified, the Son likewise is glorified, and likewise the Spirit. So to our unique triune God, be all glory forever. Amen. Amen.